So thanks, Michelle. Uh, thanks so much for the waking us up this morning. I'm hoping I'm not going to now put everybody to sleep. So. Oh, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about community-based participatory research and public policy change. That's um, uh, uh, what I've been tasked to do today. Um, I was really kind of hoping to do something more interactive, but this space doesn't really work well for it. So what I'm going to try to do is, um, is run through a presentation uh, where I'll... I'll talk about a little bit about Manitoba Research Alliance, not a ton. I think Jim Silver probably talked a little bit about the Research Alliance. Um, some of the lessons we learned uh, around um, public policy change and how community-based participatory research can affect public policy change, and I'm going to do that using a, an example of one of the research collaborations that we've been involved in, the Right to Housing Coalition. Um, and then I'm going to... Uh, go back to the, the lessons learned and put them back out to you to have a discussion about how you, you see them fitting in your community, not fitting, um, or maybe you have some other ideas. So hopefully you have lots of time for, for discussion. So if that's okay, um, I'll just start by talking a little bit about the Manitoba Research Alliance. So the MRA, uh, as we're called, is a, is a consortium of university researchers, community-based researchers, and community-based organizations. We, we're currently funded uh, through a Social Sciences Humanity Research Council grant, and one of the seven-year partnership grants. This is our third multi-year SHRC grant. Um, uh, and what's really unique about our, cons uh, our, our group is that we're administered through Canadian Centre for Policy Alternative Manit Manitoba. And this is one of the few SHRC grants held by non-university in institutions. It's significant for us because anybody who's dealing with the university, I mean, we still have to deal with, you know, with some of that, but there's a lot more flexibility and we don't get quite as bogged down in bureaucracy, so it's, it's made it, uh, I think, a really important way for us to carry out the research that we do. But it's really difficult to get a SHRC grant if you're not a university institution. Um, so as we've been talking over the past couple of days, um, there are many different approaches to doing community-based research. Um, uh, we take the approach at the MRA that moves beyond research to action, and there's been a lot of talk about action, uh, which is really uh, refreshing to hear. Um, but I'm going to talk specifically about it in terms of uh, as, a, a, as a tool to move public policy, and that is a particularly difficult thing to do. I was just reading over some of the sticky notes out on the table in the action category. And uh, some, somebody wrote down, um, the gap between research and action is based on political will in capitals. And that really is true, and so it does make it very challenging in the environments that we're in um, to, to affect uh, policy change. Another person wrote, uh, it's the most difficult part of doing research, the action part. Um, and then somebody, there are many things said, but another one that stood out for me was the idea that action is not a report or a publication. And so these are things that were also discussed this morning, and so I think they're really important things for us to always keep in mind. Um, so I like, I mean, there are many definitions of community-based participatory research. I like this simple one that, um, uh, and I think kind of guides the work that we do at the MRA, the idea that the involvement of, of people in doing their own research for social change. And so I think from what I've been hearing people talk about, uh, this seems to be um, something that, that is shared with this group. So um, very much uh, about moving, uh, moving the needle on, uh, in a more progressive uh, direction. Our research, again, a theme that's come up uh, in all the discussions that I've been part of is the idea of respectful, trusting relationships. Um, that's critical from the onset, even before you start the research process. Um, our research typically involves collaboration between academic researchers and community members, as does um, most of what uh, we've been talking about uh, in the past couple days. Our approach validates multiple forms of knowledge and methods of dissemination. Uh, this is really important for us, uh, that we don't get caught up in sort of those narrow ideas of, uh, as Michelle talked about this morning, you know, publishing in journals and that sort of thing, sole authored publications and that sort of hierarchy of publishing. Um, and we're really motivated with the goal of social justice. We're also, um, which is, this is very important to us, we work in a, in a, in a community that is, uh, has a very high indigenous population, many of our community partners are indigenous, 
We work with a lot of indigenous organizations. So it's really important for us that we are reminded that Western ways of knowing um, are not, don't have privacy over indigenous ways of, no, no, of knowing, as well as the knowledge that comes from lived experience. So we try to be respectful of all those. And we also operate from this basic principle that everyone brings knowledge to the table. University academics bring some skills, but so does everybody else, and our skills are no better than anybody else's skills. It's just what we can offer um, to, the, um, to the research partnership. Um, I know the term transformative gets thrown around a lot, um, but I, I, I think from the beginning when we started doing our research back in the early 2000s, um, we've been talking about really aspiring to do research that's transformative. And that again has many different meanings. It could be transformative at the policy level, which is for me as somebody who comes to uh, research from more of a, a community activist place. I came to research later in life. Um, transformative is, has that kind of meaning for me, but it also means uh, research that can be transformative at the individual level, and there were some examples given at the, the work, one of the workshops that I was at um, yesterday. So, you know, we need to think about what transformative means and, not, and, and in a meaningful way and not just sort of toss that, that word around. Um, we also do really try to challenge oppressive social structures, again, embracing inclusion, um, and uh, disseminating findings broadly in diverse ways that, that, that support our social justice aims. Um, and again, as we talked about uh, this morning, we aim to be, move beyond the generation of knowledge just for the sake of generating knowledge and uh, really using it as a tool uh, to em empower and mobilize communities to engage in public change. And so, it's really important for us in the work in the model that we have is to begin with research ideas that come from the community. So, um, I have the example of uh, a, one time a woman uh, from a, a university met with me and was interested in getting involved in community-based research, and and she hadn't done it before, and she was very well-meaning and you know very keen to participate. But she said to me, "How do I get the community to be interested in my research?" And I said, "Well, actually, you need to probably flip that around." You. You need, the community needs to, you know, tell you and you need to work with them to do the research. So, you know, as we, we try to always operate from that model. So I'm going to proceed now with, with some, some lessons learned uh, through one of the projects that I've been involved with uh, since about 2005. Um, and it's with the Right to Housing Coalition in, in Manitoba. Um, and I'm going to just go through sort of some lessons learned some, um, and then Again, I'm going to go back to you to talk about those and see how they fit for you and maybe you have some ideas about um, uh, given your context because we are all in different contexts. So Right to Housing Coalition is a Winnipeg-based advocacy organization. It does focus on the broader province, but you know we have this issue in our province where you know we're very um, we tend to do everything in Winnipeg. It's a real problem, but you know we're the one major city in, in our province and so that, uh, that is the reality. So it is Winnipeg-based. Um, there, it's it's made it has about 58 organizational members and about 250 plus individual members. Uh, people coming from all walks of life. Um, uh, it started off as an initiative that came from the faith community, um, who uh, were really concerned about uh, seeing uh, housing uh, lack of access to affordable housing for. Um, low-income people, and particularly they were interested in the, the reality for newcomers. So um, as a result of that group, they called upon myself at the time when I was uh, working at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives doing research on, on housing issues, and so I kind of connected with them and have been involved in that uh, uh, coalition ever since. Um, they've really expanded um, their understanding of what it means uh, to be uh, to, to have a lack of housing and, and again, have become very politicized uh, throughout the years. And so, again, our 2 age for to frame it in that, that put it in that framework, they really did expose an issue that was a problem in our uh, community. And then they looked at how do we, you know, propose some solutions, what do we do about it, and then really politicized uh, their membership uh, through, through um, political action. So, so R2H, which we call it, is, um, really has had some success. Many, many challenges, took a long time to get a little bit, but we have had some success. 
Um, and we've done that by draw upon research um, uh, and policy analysis to put housing on the political radar in our community, um, engaging researchers and doing both qualitative research, also quantitative research, um, um, uh, being really strategic in the approach and remaining really focused and disciplined. And these are some of the key lessons learned that I'm going to go through. The other is, uh, is really the ability to seize upon political opportunities to move the ideas forward, and that's been really critical to success. So these seven, um, this is a list of seven sort of overarching themes, I guess, are, are really some of the key lessons that we, we've learned. I mean, we've learned many other things. It'll be interesting to hear from you what kinds of lessons you learn in the work that you do. Um, but these are sort of some key things that we think that we've uh, learned over the, uh, the, the many years that we've been engaged. Um, so I'm going to go through these and give an example of each of, the, of, of how this has played out for Right to Housing Coalition. Okay, so the first one is the coalition advantage. So the real, and uh, anyone here who's working in community, or how many people here work in community-based organizations? Okay, so you can all relate to the idea of concerns about your charitable status and concerns about your funding. It's very challenging for individual organizations, as much as they know uh, that systems need to change um, uh, more broadly, it's really difficult for organizations to do political uh, advocacy work because they're very vulnerable. You know, their funding could be on the line and certainly uh, charitable status as well, especially uh, when in the Harper government, they were making it really, really difficult for people um, with charitable status. So, you know, uh, Issue-based coalitions can be really helpful because it can allow people to participate in political advocacy but kind of do it in the background and have that coalition be the voice that gets out in front. And so coalitions are typically not receiving any funding and um, they don't have charitable status. So they can do that work. Um, the challenge is also that because there's no funding, you've got people doing it off the sides of their desks or doing it as, uh, as volunteers. Uh, right to Housing Coalition was really fortunate because it had a number of people that were really leading that group who were retired. And it was an amazing group of people who took it, made it their priority in their retirement to focus on, um, on housing issues. So that, that was really one benefit. And then of course other people are contributing from the sides of their desks at work, and you all know what that's about. And um, we were able to get a little bit of research money through the Research Alliance to do some work. So. Uh, it all came together um, uh, and gave, I believe gave us a really good advantage. A second uh, thing that we thought was really important for our success was to get the, the ask right. This is always a big challenge, um, um, but we, 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 we were able to focus in on a particular ask that we thought was a reasonable ask. Uh, and, in a, in a, and, and also get on the agenda some, some timelines, and so timelines and targets. Um, the target that we came up with was building 300 units of social housing a year. There was no social housing being built when we came up with this target. We came to this, there were a bunch of reasons how we got to the 300 units, which I won't go into, but it also represented a, a less than a 1% of the provincial budget. And we were focusing our campaign on the provincial government at that time for reasons. Um, it was more open to our ideas. At the time, we had a federal government. It was a Harper government, not interested in social housing. Municipally, we weren't having much luck either. So we thought, well, we're going to focus on the province. This is a reasonable ask, 300 units. You know, it really doesn't cost that much. Um, and we also came up with this target because we also were concerned about how we frame the issues. How do we get public support for this really important issue, which is really a poverty issue, right? Um, the problem when you, you know, and I'm also involved in, in, in uh, with Make Poverty History Manitoba, it's really difficult to get people on side with things like increasing social assistance rates. People just don't support that idea. So we thought, well, um, you know, many people in social housing are inadequately housed, can't afford their housing, people are a little bit more open to the idea of people having a roof over their head. So we thought, okay, well, well, let's focus on this and see if we can get something moving in this area. So it was really strategic. Um, not everyone agreed with us. Like, there were people who would come to the coalition and thought that we weren't asking for enough, but we thought, well, you know, let's just go with this and see what, how that works. So we established that as um, what we thought was a reasonable target and a reasonable uh, timeline. 
Um, the third thing that we learned was the need to cultivate a loud and a consistent voice. To be disciplined in our message and not to change the ask and don't money the message. Uh, 300 new social units, sorry, this was a social housing units per year for five years. That's our message. That's what we're going after. So that's challenging because, you know, we're a coalition that's open to people coming and their people are coming and going and you would meet once a month and, you know, inevitably you'd have people coming and say, well, we should be doing this or this is a problem. And they were all problems and they were all things that we knew that we should be doing, but it was just complicating things. So we said, yes, we agree, but we need to focus on this. When we get this, then maybe we can look at some of the other things. So we, you know, some people left and didn't come back because they didn't like that, but we really felt it important to stick to this one thing ta that was tangible. Um, the fourth thing that was really, really critical for us, and then this one kind of fell on our lap, so, um, and I understand that, this is, but, but I think the critical piece is around timing is everything, is that if something, to be prepared, because you never know when something's going to open up and there might be an opening for you to seize an opportunity. And, um, and then also remaining strategic. So for this one, uh, we had it all, you know, costed out. We were, we were you know, working uh, for several years with our target, and we weren't getting very far, but we had this, this plan, and it was costed out, and, and we were uh, very organized around it. We had the case in Manitoba where we, uh, our premier stepped down, so there was going to be a leadership campaign, and this was an NDP government at the time. And so we thought, oh, well, this is a government who at least you know, is open to ideas around social housing. So this is our opportunity to get a commitment because we know that the people who are going to be selecting the leader are going to be NDP members who are going to agree with this idea of social housing. So we made, it, uh, made a campaign around targeting those leadership candidates and getting them to commit to this target and timeline. So that was very effective because they both did because, of course, you know, they're not going to you know, let the one person get ahead of them. So they both were committed to it. And so then when that was, leadership was over, we had a new premier who had, in effect, committed to 300 units a year. So we were, we were pretty excited about that. We thought that was a really uh, smart move on our behalf. We thought we were very clever. Uh, but it turned out actually quite well. Um, it's not ended well, but anyway, that's the other issue. These things are always very complicated. Um, uh, so, you know, just so what we did do is we, we did get that commitment around the 300 units a year and, and the government, you know, it, was, it went into the, the throne speech right after that leader, uh, the leadership. And so, you know, we had something tangible now to hold the government account to. Um, the fifth one, I've got seven of these, um, is to use multi-pronged approaches. So, looking at both consensus tactics and conflict taxes, because you know, you, there are times when you need to be, use both of these things. And not everybody is good at both of them. So you need those folks who are really good with, you know, doing the schmoozing with policymakers. Some people are really good with that, and they can, you know, be very, um, um, have no problem, you know, meeting with policymakers even when, it, when they don't feel that it's going their way. You need to take those approaches because those are the people who make the, are making the decisions, and we need to get some of them on side. So you need to, to do that. Then you, but you also need to be pushing back and continues to push. So even when we had a provincial government that was open to some of these ideas, they moved very slowly. And so we needed to push. So we would be writing, you know, articles in the newspaper, and we would be out, you know, doing uh, political action. And so, you know, using both of those strategies. So you need to be open to both of those, and you know, think strategically about when to use each of them. Um, building positive relationships, and in and, and this I, mean, I don't mean the positive relationships with the people that are your research and action partners. I mean build, because that's a given, you need to do that way before any of this starts. Well, I'm talking about building positive, positive relationships with those people who can make decisions about these sorts of things. Um, so, um, and so R2H has been quite good at this. I have to say, I had a, a little conversation briefly, uh, Colleen, I hope I don't... Oh, okay, Br briefly about this, but it, it is true. Um, we were really lucky because we had, to be quite frank, some older white men leading this coalition, retired white men. That helped because somehow, you know, it's the, the retired white guy, and also from faith based community, he goes in there and somehow they listen a little bit more. That didn't hurt us. Frustrating. 
you know, that that's where we're still at in this world, but that actually um, was a reality for us. Um, so, right to housing is learned to be strategic and um, to be, but also critically, uh, and to be critical and apply pressure uh, when needed. Um, and so, even now, we've had a government change. I'll talk briefly about that. We've had a government change. Uh, the, the, the relationships are pretty deep with people in the bureaucracy, and although you know, the tide has you know, changed, we, there still are some really solid relationships with people in the bureaucracy that we're trying to figure out now how do we work through to get to, to move forward. The seventh one, the final one, is really the idea that research and action can affect policy to change. Again, there are many factors that contribute. It's not simple. It takes a long time. Um, but I do believe that we need to be persistent. Um, including research in that action, in that formula, I think is really important because it can help us keep, keep us on track and give us some important evidence to use in our political action. Um, you have to be prepared for setbacks. We're experiencing those setbacks right now, but Right to Housing Coalition remains strong. Um, and, it, and partly it is because it's been very focused on, on its work. Um, and we have to be really diligent and persistent, um, especially when we're dealing with you know, changing political um, environments. So the impact then, we, we had an impact. We, the, we, the provincial government and the previous provincial government surpassed the target of 300 new social units annually. Uh, and they retrofitted a significant number of, six, of, of existing social units. Jim Silver did a presentation about Lord Selkirk Park uh, last night, and that's one example of the, the commitment to um, uh, retrofitting uh, social housing. It also, and I'm not going to talk about this one because I don't have time, but it also, uh, Right to Housing Coalition partnered with Make Poverty History Manitoba to push the government to, to increase its support uh, for low-income renters, and they put together a program called Rent Assist, which um, uh, uh, um, ensures that people who are earning under a certain income don't pay more than 75% of the median market rent. This is all under attack now, but that, that was an important policy that the past government did, and again, um, that was all based on the research as well that we did and continue to advocate for. So now we're in a different time. We've got a changing political landscape. Uh, we're trying to do policy advocation or advocacy at a time uh, when our government is focused on austerity, and that means you know wanting to reduce the debt and cut taxes and all the things that are not helpful when you're trying to push forward a social justice uh, mandate. And so groups like Right to Housing Coalition are really trying to regroup, think about new strategies. Uh, one, for example, is focusing now, putting more focus on the feds because they seem to be more open and looking at the, the agreements between the feds and the province to see if there's room there. To, uh, so there's, again, um, you know, lots of work to do and it's frustrating that we're moving backwards, but that's the way, uh, the reality. So I wanted to kind of turn this back now to you and just go through these seven points and maybe just get a sense, what is this, like, does this resonate with you or doesn't or... You know, or just how does this fit in terms of your community? So, so first of all, um, I'll go through them and then people can, we'll just open it up for discussion. So the first one, the coalition advantage. Is there an issue that the community can mobilize around, is mobilizing around? Does this idea of exposing, proposing, politicize, you know, or is, is that helpful? Uh, is that happening? I'm sure it is in many different ways. Um, what about the idea of getting the ask right? Ask right thinking strategically and, and being reasonable in the context. That's a, that's a tough one because often activists want, you know, to, you know, we want to change the world and, you know, focusing on some little thing can be challenging, but does that make sense to people? Um, cultivating a loud and consistent voice, that idea of staying on message where I'll, knowing that sometimes people aren't going to like that, does that make sense as a strategy? Um, the, the issue around timing, are you having any of that uh, here? I know you've got a probably a provincial situation similar to ours. But I know um, from talking to Colleen, there's a progressive mayor in Saskatoon, so maybe there is that's an opening, right? So, um, and then the idea of using consensus approaches and conflict approaches. Like, do you know who your allies are in government? Uh, is there public support, political will? Um, and then uh, building positive relationships. Again, moving beyond relationships with your partners, 
but looking at is are your friends in government that can maybe help uh, in any way, even if it's small, helping you maneuver through your systems. And then again, um, how are you taking advantage of the skills in your community? So bringing in the research piece, people who are good at lobbying, people who are good at organizing, uh, and then the public education piece, and bringing those all together so that you have uh, a model that's built from you know, research and uh, public policy advocacy. So that's it. I just want to open it up. I don't know. Do people have any thoughts on any of this, or ideas, or what's happening here? Yeah. I, I just wanted um, if you could expand on the idea of um, you know I think that coalitions are very yep. powerful, um, whereas individual groups, especially if they receive some funding, municipal mm -hmm. or provincial funding, um, can't be very political. Yeah. But if those groups form a coalition and the members of the smaller groups are part of the coalition, how are they not um, prohibited from being political, considered political? Because I know with some, some organizations they explicitly state we are not, uh, you, know, we're, you know, we're not an advocacy group yeah. or we're not uh, political in that sense, but then those members go over to the coalition. Yeah. Like, how, how does that work? Well, then? so we have many, the Right to Housing and Make Poverty History and other groups that I'm involved, we have many, many members, and, and sometimes you do get organizations that say, no, we're not touching that. But yeah. others will say, well, if we're just a member among, you know, 60 other members, we're not, we're not spending, so what is it, the 10% that you're allowed to maybe do any political, uh, yeah. You're not really. You're you're a member, so you're 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 not putting in a whole bunch of time, right? And you're also the more of you are, that are on that list, yeah. you know, you're you're less vulnerable. So, but some people don't are still afraid to get involved. That's for sure. But we have some, you know, many many different types of organizations who are community are government funded that are members and have never. It's not how they've not been hurt by them as far as we know. Yeah, as with poverty free Saskatchewan and, and poverty Regina, we don't keep formal members. Okay, lists. yeah. Um, I mean, there, there are a few people yeah. who are out front. Um, it, in, in the case of the chair, they're specifically that's part of their mandate. So right. they don't right. get. And in, in my case, I run the Facebook page. I'm not. Right. Affiliated, and right. I still call myself activist at yeah. large. Yeah, and that happens too, right? Yeah. yeah, people just do it without putting their name down when they get involved. Yeah, yeah. And, sure. uh, so, so it, it does happen here, and it has, but you often um, have to be cautious about your structure too. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that can be complicated as well. Okay, there's uh, there's three people I see, and so I'm going to go at the very back. Or oh, sorry. Second. Um, yeah, um, I just one point of information: the ten percent around the advocacy work has been rescinded. Yeah. And organizations like Kairos have been given back. Okay. Yeah. Status. So that no longer that advocacy rule no longer applies, and so be as political as you want. Okay. So that's good. Yeah. So. Um, and that was just recently, right? I think yeah, that was like in the yeah, last month yeah, or so. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Um, the other. Th the question I have is in regards to the whole process mm -hmm. and where, uh, if at all, you integrate any kind of analysis that looks at issues of race or ability or gender or... So we, again, so this is a consortium that's not just research, right? So it's a broad consortium, there's a research piece, and we draw on all that research and we have, as part of that, different research projects that, that uh, that we draw on. So, for example, right now um, uh, we're doing a research project that's that's uh, driven by the West Central Women's Resource Center that's looking at uh, homelessness through a gender lens because you know this is an issue as well. A lot of the homelessness strategies don't do that, right? So, so we have our partners who come to the table and say, well, we need to be doing those sorts of analysis, and so we do that. So we have many research projects that we draw on. And so then when we look at the units, so it's not just simply we need 300 more units, we also look at well, what, what kind of housing is needed. So, so you need a certain number of units that are multiple uh, bedrooms you know, for larger families, looking at issues of newcomers with large families, 
you need, you know, we need a number of units that are for, uh, you know, one of the, the, the challenges we see really common is, is um, older women increasingly homeless. Um, so we need to be focusing on do we have sufficient. So we do do that work in the background and it's part of the, when we work, when we were working more closely with the province, when we looked at the units that we needed, we would have that analysis as well included. So does that, I don't know if that answers your question, but... No? So it's sort of, I mean, I, I don't understand how it's actually integrated into research frameworks. I see that it comes as an add-on? No, no, no. The, all of, it, it's part of our research. So when we, we have many research, this isn't just a research project. This is a broader project around, focused on the political advocacy, and as part of it, we have various research projects. And so, but when we focused on that specific ask of the units, because again, we were specific that we need more social housing units, one of the things that we did was an analysis, and we continue to do that analysis, of what kinds of units do you need. So that research is there uh, that filters through the, the ask that we're focusing on. So we do have that research. We know, you know, there's, these are the, the, the areas that we are in most need of housing for different types of families, different types of situations. I obviously didn't answer your question. I'm not sure how else to answer it, but I'm going to go on to the other folks. So. Okay, I, there were three people in this area, and then I'll come back to you. Sorry, I, just maybe yeah, one of you. Yeah, sure. Um, so this actually, this set reminds me very much of the disability and the support coalition that we have here. And um, through that, uh, we ended up um, helping create the SET program. And, um, but it wasn't enough just to create it, but we have to continue to be working to maintain it, right? Because, uh, you know, we need to come in and cut to the post and like that. And I was wondering, um, in your experience with this, if, um, if that seems to be the same kind of thing, where you have a commitment, but then you still have to time it took you to get there. So do you have a commitment from, in this example, from the province to do something? And is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, it took us a long time. That's why, I mean, this is the issue with all of this, right? It's like, really, if you look at in the overall scheme of things, we did not really make that much progress, right? Because we needed a lot more than we were asking for. And we did continuously have to be pushing the province. Another thing that was really useful about this ask, though, was and actually, one of the reasons we came to this specific ask around a number of units um, was that we would go to the province and we would say, okay, well, tell, you know, have you built any new social housing units? And they would say, well, and they would skirt around it and they would say, well, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. And they would, you know, you would, people would just baffle gab. People, they have all this information, you know, about all the, and, and people had no clue what they were talking about. It was overwhelming. And again, you're talking about people who are not housing, you know, like they're not experts on everything that's going on in the housing world. They just know that there's this big gap. Um, so that when we focused on these 300 units, we were able to then go to them. That's lovely that you've done all this, but have you done this? This is what, you know, the anti-poverty community is saying that is needed. And so we kept doing that, going back to them. And so once we had the commitment from the, the government, we could go back because they had committed to the 300, so we could go back and say, okay, how many units have you created? Where are those units? You know, what you know, configuration are the units? Who are being served by the units? So that's what, the way we were able to do that. And still do it, but now again, the commitment's not there, so it's a bit of a, more of a challenge. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Someone else? Yeah. just wanted to ask you uh, about your multi-prong mm -hmm. approach. Um, uh, so, so when when was there a cutoff of the uh, of the sort of conflict approach, or did you, you know, was it a consensual approach that you had tried first, or did you do it simultaneously, or what was the, the way in which you, you both went for you know sit down kind of conversations with policymakers as opposed to yeah. kind of you know big media releases and then kind of like that. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I don't know which came first, but they always, we worked, that we never abandoned one for the other, like we were always doing both. So, um, 
And we were also very open with those relationships that we had developed with policymakers, saying, you know what, you're not moving on this, and so, you know, we're going to, you know, we're, and then we would let them know if we were, okay, we're, you know, we're going to be doing this action next week, or, um, and we didn't let them influence our decisions, but because, you know, for us, it was like, this is what we need, and we are focused on getting this, and we're happy to work with you, but if you're not moving, then we got to do this, and so, some people, you know, there's mi mix. Some some people in government get that, and they're actually happy to have people pushing because God knows they get enough pressure from the other direction, right? But other people don't like it. But we just, we, you know, we just continue to do that. And so, um, you know, everybody knew that, you know, the the right to housing coalition was out there, and this was their focus, and and um, yeah. But we use both of those tactics, and still using both of those tactics now. We mostly were focused with the province at that time because the federal government was just not, I mean, it was just no, no doors open at all. So we, which is why we only focused on the 300 units because we thought, okay, well, in the absence of federal money, not that we didn't do advocacy there, but, you know, it was more difficult. Um, we focused the 300 ask on the province. Um, now, again, this is changing, right, because the provincial doors are closing. The feds, as you know, as imperfect as they are, at least are talking about some of these things. So we're now looking at how we kind of talk to the feds to see if we can't influence somehow the agreements with the province around social housing agreements that they're establishing now. So, so you know, there are, and we have subgroups too, that subgroups that are focused on the feds, subgroups that are focused on the province. We've got a group that's focused on the municipal government, which can do not as much, but there are lots of different um, tools that they could be using around things like inclusionary zoning and that, so we have a municipal group that focuses on that. So it's, you know, it's a pretty, uh, it's, you know, it's all volunteers, but it's, it's, you know, got different layers of people focused on. Yes? So, I, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your presentation. How long did it take you to get the coalition sort of from the formation or yeah. the period to sort yeah. of, you know, um, you know, a place where it could begin this advocacy? So the coalition formally started in, a, it was a 2005, uh, and again, it started really small with this faith-based group of folks. Um, then we started branching out from there, community organizations started uh, joining, um, again, members from the community, you know, individuals who themselves were um, experiencing housing and accessibility. Uh, our first... So and we developed our, our, our strategy around the 300 units. It took us, you know, a little over a year because some of that research had already been done, but then we started to do more research. Um, and then uh, we didn't really actually see any real progress around the number of units um, until, you know, five or six years later. Yeah, I mean, it's very slow. The reason I'm asking, yeah. if you don't mind. No, I don't so mind. Of course. People right here, so I'm going to just throw this out there. That, um, I'm just thinking about the, how, how we could utilize a coalition for something like the stolen children yeah. um, in Saskatchewan, for example, the high numbers of Indigenous children that are overrepresented and mm -hmm. have been for really probably 40 years now. Yeah. So this is, I think, a very effective strategy. Yeah. You know, just really so, you know, focusing in on like a very specific. So, yeah, so thank, thank you for yeah. we yeah I'll, I won't go off on a tangent, but uh, maybe I'll talk to you later about sure. some of the other uh, act, activities that are going on similar to that that have kind of focused on some specific asks that I'm not, oops sorry as involved in but okay yeah sorry. Um, yeah. For sure. I mean, you know. We talk to them and they nod their heads and we're doing, you know, we're doing things, right? So, but they, you know, and they, you know, the cons, the, you know, the common argument is, well, we can only do so much, we don't have the resources, right? So, but yes, they're well aware of, uh, of those, uh, the obligation 
that these that people do have a right to housing, but it's really got no, you know, there's no, it, there's not really any meat to those, right? It's like, it's like, there's not much we can do with it rather than, you know, shame them a little bit, but that doesn't work. You know, they, they find a way to get around that, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah? I just wanted to, to, to ask you to please advance the slide. I want to hide it all time. Sorry? Could I get you to just please advance the slide? Oh, sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm going to kind of push the conversation a different direction, sure. I yeah. guess, or, or be a bit of a protagonist in the room, yeah. and say that, um, yes, you know, as community based organizations, as researchers on and on, we do have an obligation to push um, conversations. But we can't go to governments and say, you need to do better. We would expect as taxpayers that the response would be, yes, we've got multiple um, priorities, multiple challenges. Where we have to be strong is in the ask, and making sure we're asking a responsible ask, making sure that it's a tangible ask, so that it can be repeatedly of, of governments, of other agencies, and that it is something that resonates with the public. Because we can say and bang the table as much as we want that this is something that's important, and unless it resonates with the public, it's not going to be on a politician's table. And furthermore, we can be political but not partisan, because these issues will be there throughout many, many governments. And if you burn the bridge with one, they're not going to help you as opposition. Mm -hmm. so, so we have to be measured and strong in what we do and, and not Pollyanna about it. Um, Medicare was not publicly supported initially. I'm just saying to move things, to move things, we have to be strategic, we have to be measured, and yes, there's times where, where we have to be unpopular. But otherwise, you'll, we'll be called wing nuts. Yeah. And, and that's the reality. <laughs> and so we can choose We can choose to do things. When we, when we take those big leaps, we have to do them strategically and for purpose. Yeah. I mean, it's just a pragmatic approach. I mean, and I agree with you know, other approaches as well. And people need to do what they're comfortable with. But... Um, I guess I've become of the mind that, you know, we're not going to overthrow capitalism tomorrow. So, well, you know, that would be lovely, but I don't think it's going to happen. And so we have to then find other ways to get something useful for people. And again, it's, it's not the only thing that we should be doing. It's not the end all, but it's a thing. And you can have, you know, make some tangible impact on people's lives. I'm not saying it's the only thing that you do, though, but I agree, like... Sometimes we do have to be a bit pragmatic about things. That's just where I come to for those reasons. Because if you keep banging on a wall, you know, banging on the door with the ask that's just not acceptable to anybody, then you don't get anywhere. So you can do that, but then maybe try to do some pragmatic work too. Yep. I was wondering um, if all of the super coalition well want to do the same thing, where or how you position So, um, in different ways, so uh, some of the, the work that we've done in terms of the analysis around, uh, you know, the cost of building new social housing, like that's been critical to our work as well, to be able to say, we know that to build, you know, it, 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 and we got, we got all this information from government bureaucrats, how much does it cost to build a social housing unit? You know, what's the cost of subsidy over there? So we cost those things out so that we can go with that information to government. So that we can say, well, you know, this really isn't that unrealistic for you to do this. It represents this much. This represents this much of your budget. This is so we use that type of research in that way. But we also do a lot of qualitative research um, uh, to tell people stories about this is what uh, it has been the impact on my life because I do not have housing that meets my needs. Um, also, being open to those stories. So I'll just give you a quick example about that because this was. Um, uh, 
make, making yourself accessible so that people hear about the campaign as well is important, and people who, who are affected uh, by, by uh, not having adequate housing uh, is an important way to do it, and that idea of you know, knowledge mobilization that's broad and, and reaches people. Um, we had, um, a, this was back when I was working at CCPA, um, uh, a, a gentleman walked it, uh, phoned me one day, and he was telling me a story about being, um, his housing story, about, you know, going to be losing his apartment because the rent had gone up, and, you know, the, the, that story, that's all too familiar. And it's, it's, the frustrating thing is you're, like, I'm doing research. I can't do anything about the individual story. So, but this man was just so, you really want to share a story. He's very articulate. And I said, well, have you ever thought about, uh, and it was an important story because I thought it would be one that would resonate with the public. So I said to him, would you, have you ever thought about writing an article in the newspaper to share your story uh, with the public? Um, and he said, oh, well, I wouldn't be able to do that. And I says, well, you've just given me all the information. I would be happy to help you do it if you would like. And, you know, you, and so he said, okay. So he came into my office, and I said, okay, I'll help you with this. And he dropped off this uh, file folder full of all his little write, write, he had some mental health issues, and so he would write notes tiny, and, you know, they were, I was like, oh, God, I don't know if I can actually do this. But it turned out it was quite easy, you know, I just sorted them out, and so I wrote a draft for him, and he came back in, and he sat with me, and he goes, no, that's not right, that's not right, and so I fixed it up for him, and, you know, we kind of did it together. I had the skill that I could write, he had the story, and so it was his story. I didn't, I just wanted to help him put it out there if he wanted to. And so he put that, uh, you know, we put that in the in the in the paper, and they, they accepted it, and and it, you know he put a different name so that he could be anonymous. They allowed him to do that, and it, it sort of went out as Joe's story. And you know, there's been so many people um, come to write to housing that saw that story and then wanted to get involved. So it's like different ways of getting those. So that's you know maybe some people wouldn't call that research. I call that research. This gentleman you know, had a whole host of stuff that was his life and, and the story of his challenges. And so, you know, you put, put that out there and, and um, you use the different tools that, that you can. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's trying to find different ways to, you know, to gather research and put it out there in different ways that can be effective. Some of it's, you know, the, the data, the numbers that mean, it, the government responds to, but some of it is just stories that then people might understand why you know investing in housing is important. Yeah. Um, I really like the like multi pronged um, approach. Uh, I guess I'm just wondering like how do you choose you know who in government to like approach yeah. and uh, especially when there isn't exactly that political mm -hmm. will and you know like with the government that we're right. dealing with in Saskatchewan. Sure. Well, I mean, and that's the, the issue around, do you know who your allies are? Like, usually in any government department, they may not have any power, but you're likely to have some allies. And so if you can start to recognize who those people are, they might be able to direct you. You know what? I might want to talk, and because you need to reach the people up here, right? Um, so you might be able to find people that way, um, uh, you know, but ideally, you know, you need, you know, you need the political will, which I, whoever wrote that, note out there, I absolutely agree with it, that's critical, um, but um, if you can find different ways, sometimes you can, you know, again, it's harder for us now, so I mean, I don't have all the answers to these things. We, part of what happened for us kind of was just a chain of events that we were ready for, and, um, but yeah, you just have to find your allies, they might not be in positions of power, but they might have some, you know, sort of intel that they can sort of share about how to maneuver through. Doesn't always work, but that's, so, so I'll come back. What um, consistently we talk about building coalitions, building alliances, identifying allies within mm -hmm. governments. Yes. Not a lot of discussion about how we might go about changing the public narrative. Yes, absolutely. And reaching outside of our circles, yep. the people not affected, but who are the, the voters. Yep. I don't like the term taxpayers. The, the voters. Yeah. The voters, yeah. the citizens, the residents who maybe aren't part of yep. this whole 
experience. In fact, most of the people we talk to in research are people who are accessing services, if talking about specifically anti-poverty. Mm -hmm. But that even represents yeah. only a fraction of the people who are yeah. living in poverty. Yeah. I don't know if everybody heard that, because it's just a really important point. Um, it's how do we reach those voters who aren't really, who, who are not, you know, we, we talk amongst ourselves, probably nobody here disagrees that we need more social housing, but how do you reach those people who, because the political will is all about the voters, right? That's the reality, you know, what the polling tells them, you know, that's where, you know, where they're going to go. I don't know, we're struggling with that as well at Right to Housing and Make Poverty History, Manitoba, um, trying, you know, one of the things in, I'm not part of a faith community, but, and I, I had a whole change of heart around faith communities as a result of working with Right to Housing Coalition because there's some amazing people who are, are involved in those communities. I think that's a place, and we're starting to strategize around that, going to some of these churches and talking to congregations, because those are those people, and a lot of them are conservative voters. Um, and so if you can start to reach some of those people to recognize, you know, these are important issues, and, and then for them to reach out and tell their, you know, uh, you know, politicians that this is a, important to them. I think all of, there's many, many strategies, and I don't think we're there anywhere near there, as we can see by, you know, the kinds of folks that are being elected, you know. Um, but that is the big question, I think. How do we reach out there and get support for these issues? Maybe someone here has the answer. I don't. Finding new ways to do that. Oh, Colleen, you have your hand. Um, I, I may have drawn this conclusion, I don't know whether you actually said it or not, but is the right to end housing goal of 300 units a year a poverty reduction strategy? Yeah. And if so, are you longitudinally tracking the individuals who use those units and are they actually leaving poverty? Yeah. And a new group of people are coming in yeah. and there's actually a changeover? Right. And that is the other issue. So one of the things that we've been talking about at Right to Housing now is um, how are we going to track, uh, how can we track what's happening to people now? Because it's not only, because you're right, I mean, because there's other pressures now happening in this. Are they going to scale back their social assistance? Because there, you know, like there, there are many issues. So again, you know, it's frustrating because you think you've made a little progress and then you're, you know, you move backwards. But that's what we're actually strategizing around right now at Right to Housing, is how can we develop a project where we can start to measure what's happening to people uh, in terms of, do they have housing? Is there, is there rent remaining? You know, Because we think that, well, we know that they're actually increasing the rents now. Um, um, so that's happening. Are they uh, losing their, their places? We know that now we've seen some new social housing built, but we've seen some being torn down. And so we've lost, you know, uh, some prime units in, in uh, sort of close to the downtown of Winnipeg, and what's that going to be replaced with? So we have a lot of research to do, and part of it is to track what's happening with people, and is it having a meaningful impact in terms of the, their um, bringing them up to poverty? Probably not, right? Yeah. Because there are many other factors. So, but some people will, would say, and I know many folks that I've talked to say, like, so for example, Joe is one of them who eventually did get a a social housing unit and was, you know, feeling that, that he had housing that was safe. And he said that, he would say that, you know, I have a, a roof over my head and that makes a big difference for me. I can now, you know, get food and cook it in my apartment instead of having to line up a soup bank. You know, like all of those factors which were huge in terms of, you know, impact on his life. So, again, it's not everything, it's something. One other question regarding um, the coalitions, and you know, we're dealing with power structures outside of coalitions when we have an issue that we're going to deal with, and perhaps you have have experienced this and have some solutions. But um, like, what, um, what oftentimes, or in my experience, with coalitions have come together, um, you have bigger players and smaller groups, and, and some some groups have more access to resources or funding or higher profile. Um, and and trying to move an issue forward internally, we're dealing with what I I feel is just the frustrating nonsense of egos and turf wars, and sometimes the bigger players drive the agenda a little bit more. 
I think it's it's fine to say in theory that you know everyone has an equal voice yep. at the table, everyone has an equal vote, but oftentimes that that's not always yep. the case. And if you've had an experience mm -hmm. of that with the coalition and how that's been um, addressed, yeah, I mean. Coalitions are, comp anybody who's been involved in a coalition, complicated. All of those things that you just brought up are, happen all the time. I've found, for so, there's something unique about this coalition. I don't know, I think it might be the people who came to the table initially that got it going. I have not seen that dynamic in this coalition. Everybody's really remained focused. Um, there just appears to be no egos. I don't know, again, what that's all about, but people are really good about identifying you know, what their strengths are, what they can bring. Everybody's quite respectful. I know this sounds like too good to be, too, too, too good to be true, but it, it, for something, for some reason, this has been different. Um, I think it's a lot of it, oh, and so we do still have that challenge, though, in terms of who gets a vote, who gets to decide. Well, sure, people come and they want to have an issue brought up. It's not that it's not a good issue. So you have to make, you know, we've had to make that decision as a group that this is our focus. And some people don't like that, and so they... They go and they don't come back. So is that inclusive? Yeah, probably not, right? Because we can't take on every idea. And I guess people have just, you know, decided that this is the way that we can be most effective in this group. You know, again, wouldn't be for everybody. Some people would say, well, that's not, you're not listening to the voices of people who, but, you know, you can't do everything, right? So, you know, that answers your question. Because I agree with you, I've been involved in many coalitions. Like, oh my God, you just end up walking away because it just becomes so... Difficult with personalities and yeah. egos and yeah. yeah, for sure. I think one of the things with this one maybe when it started was again like the folks who came to the table were all people who were retired. Most of them had worked in community organizations, um, you know, really progressive folks who who had nothing like they weren't you know trying to you know gain anything really personally. They weren't you know trying to you know wasn't part of their you know, moving up some sort of ladder, or that people weren't wanting to be polit politicians. They really just thought this was a terrible, you know, situation that we needed. They needed. They wanted to focus on, and so that was part of it. I think the people who got involved were just not there because of any kind of personal. I don't know. I'm not suggesting it's perfect again. Like you know, there are issues, but it's been pretty. You know, it's stuck together for quite a long time with. Very few challenges, unlike Maine Poverty History, which I'm also involved in, is just a nightmare sometimes in terms of all the um, egos and people wanting to be the spokesperson and all that. We really didn't have that so much with Rachel Anybody else? important and, and your, your comment about you know faith-based communities being very charity driven I, 
I, that is, I agree. That's why I think it's useful if we can reach out to those communities to maybe, you know, to give it, you know, to do more education. Again, I, perhaps I'm being naive about it, but I, I you know, I, I think this is a group of people that, you know, some of them, you could get to see that, you know, the need for public investment um, and not charity, sort of try to challenging that because the whole charity model and that idea of charity as a solution is so deeply ingrained, you know, in our society now that you, you really have to start challenging. I mean, the perfect example of that is food banks. We've just come to accept food banks as, you know, part of the, you know, the institutional intervention to address poverty, and that's bull. Like, we shouldn't have to have food banks. But when you say that to people, they're like, you know, they get all up in arms that you want to close the food bank. Well, I, my point is, is that nobody should have to go to a food bank. And, but that's so deeply ingrained in the faith-based community yeah. that, you know, maybe there's ways in there. And again, it's just an idea, but, um, but you're right, then packaging the research in a way that resonates with them, which is why I liked the idea. And again, we have many qualitative uh, stories about people's housing situations, but I liked... Joe's story because he, he covered all of that as this one individual who had experienced, you know, being, you know, kicked out of places because of his mental health issues and having to, you know, just the, the, the impact on his life. And then when he found housing, what, what a difference it made for him. So those stories, I think, might be kinds of things that might resonate with people in faith communities. And you can often get um, people to let you in, to talk to their congregations. It's not impossible, for sure. Yeah. With what you just said in mind, um, have there been any um, ideas or measures taken to take what uh, the results of these actions of providing housing and um, getting people into a situation where they can have access to other things that shows that the impact of this is not just for charities, not just to do good, but it's an investment in community, yeah. and have there been any way to keep track of that data and show, yeah. look, over time, this many people can, you know, have their children go into, you yeah. know, like all those, mm -hmm. the byproduct of having people be able to have access to things they could not if they didn't have a state of housing. Yeah. So, um, you're talking about both the social and economic impact of, yeah. We haven't done that yet. I mean, I think it's definitely something that we need to do. And again, especially now as we're seeing kind of, you know, moved a little bit and then we're moving backwards. So those are the kinds of things I do think that we need to do. Um, and we are also looking at that one policy that we have with rent assist that has made a pretty big difference in the lives of people in terms of increasing their income. Um, that's being uh, scaled back now, and so we want to look at that to the impact. So um, some of it is, you know, waiting for some, because that was fairly large scale, so we're waiting for, for some uh, income data uh, as well, to see, because it's basically an income supplement for people. But, yeah, there's a lot to be done again. Uh, though, and some of these are really complicated longitudinal research projects. It's really hard to, to implement and really hard to get funding for but for sure it's needed. Yeah, with that, because I'm not sure of the ethics around this, if you provide someone housing, are they obligated to report to you that, they, you know, because I, I think about that as well, let's say you have provided housing and their lives are improved, but afterwards, do they have to report, you know, how would you know those things, and um, I'm not sure if, if you know, well, for us, we don't know, like I have, you know, we're not asking anybody to report anything to us. So we would have to develop a project and then we would have to be able to find a way to reach people. I mean, that's all possible, but it's fairly, very time intensive. Um, one of the things we're talking about with Right to Housing was because we have broad connections with people who live in social housing, to look at if we could build a research project that maybe we could identify some of our partners who themselves live in social housing to maybe you know, do some focus groups in the, in the, you know, but you have to really think that through in terms of an ethics as well. But for sure, these are all things that we're starting to talk about now. So many, so many things like that you need to do. It's kind of overwhelming. You're end up getting more overwhelmed when you guys bring this step up. So yeah, yeah, we've been able to do that. Sorry. Yes, someone over there? Should I turn this off? No. Um, I guess I have kind of a comment. 
observing the, the things that have been said. And I'm um, talking about voters' political will. Last time I was in Regina, I was uh, brought by a, a family member to the Jordan Peterson talk to uh, indoctrinate in that direction. <laughs> and I think that we can't um, under emphasize the importance of community based research in dismantling like meritocracy. I really like the example that you gave uh, about Joe, because I think that when voters hear that, they're challenged in their um, conceptions that those who have, have because they merited it, and those who don't, um, they don't just because they don't merit it. And I think that's, like, talking about voters is very important because um, I guess that's one type of advocacy, like, if we, if we could somehow broadly get those around us to see that it's not all about meritocracy, yeah. and they might start to care about someone who is different from themselves. And, and charity, I think, itself is just another example of meritocracy. Like, yeah, I absolutely. Because I deserve it, but I'll give because I'm yeah. a yeah. good, outstanding citizen. Exactly. And these are such big things to try to tackle. And so, I mean, again, like, look what we've got. You know, we've got Trump in the U.S., we've got Ford now, and, like, it seems so impossible. But those people are voting for these people. Like, how do we reach those folks? So I don't know. I mean, it really is the big challenge we all have to figure out, I think. Yeah, yeah, Was there anyone else back here that hadn't had a chance yet? I raised okay. my hand for a long time. Oh, I'm sorry. I, was, I guess I'm standing like this. It's, it's been a feminine thing, so I asked. Sorry. Okay. okay. Now you, you get to ask was, like a whole bunch of things. Yeah. My question was, uh, yesterday we listened to Dr. Silva about the inner city development, yeah. where they are using like housing and education mm -hmm. to lift the people from poverty, right? So with your right to housing project, if I'm given a house, yeah. after that, what can lift me actually from poverty? You know? yeah. yeah. Well, we're not saying it's either or, but housing is a fundamental uh, yeah, barrier. What, I, what I'm saying is, yeah. what are you guys going to do more after the person is giving housing? Isn't that something like the organization yeah. can do to empower those people? So, because to yeah. even maintain a house comes with a cost. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if the person is incapable of getting a job or getting sure. any form of training. So the organizations that are members of Right to Housing do all that work. Oh, so okay. you've got newcomer organizations, you've got uh, indigenous organizations with working with people who are, are moving from First Nations to the city, you've yeah. got uh, or uh, women's uh, resource sets, Th that's who makes up the group. So and so they're like saying, people need housing. We're doing all this other stuff, okay. training organization, all of those things that you talk about are all critical. Okay. But how, we need social housing, we need public investment in housing. And that may not be their core mandate to do that, so they join forces through the coalition to do that work while they continue to do their work. Oh. So it's basically, they're saying, you know, we've got people regularly coming through our doors that need housing. So it's focused on that. But that doesn't mean that it's the only thing. And all you know, member organizations do all that work in the community. They're community-based organizations throughout the city. And I like the part that you guys have a voice of going to the top, meeting these politicians, trying to get them to buy into the idea. Because yeah. At the end of the day, as we said from yesterday, you need the money. Yeah, the money has to sure. come from the top. Yeah. So to me, I think that is a very good approach of using community-based research yeah. uh, to influence social change. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's all, it really, that's what it boils down to. In many, many areas, and housing for sure, you need that public investment for sure. So, OK, sorry. So one very, very critical understanding has to come from knowing that there is not a good relationship between information and belief and behavior. We can gather all this data, but people are very committed to their beliefs and ideas. In fact, to preserve their identification with the group will believe things they know factually to be wrong. 
how, and now, um, there's a really long YouTube video talking about how people change their minds and how we change the narrative. It's an hour and a half long. But if you get in touch with me, I can send you the link. But it's Dave McGraney in conversation with Richard Cloverman. And he talks about the success in California that the LGBTQ plus community had in turning the narrative around after they lost the vote that everyone expected to win. And, and, and it's, it's really critical to, to understand the way our minds and hearts work. And how we, uh, how it's not just about data and research. It's about how belief works and how we can change that. And there are no shortcuts. But yeah, um, so Dave McGraney in conversation with me, she got the government. Get in touch with me. I'll send you the link, and it'll get you started on a way of thinking about yeah. that. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think we're hitting the hook here, so. This is the hook. Um, I just, uh, I think Thank everybody for that contribution. We're so excited to have uh, Shauna here. And um, uh, Shauna is very humble and she's not really, uh, uh, she worked tirelessly for years for the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. And I'm just thrilled to bits that, uh, the university saw the wisdom, uh, you know, with the help of people, good people like Jim Silver, that said you'd be crazy not to hire her, because we need people like this who are community activists that are working within our university system. And you know, so Shauna, thank you so much for for this. And uh, uh, lunch is in the same place as yesterday. It's a little bit shorter today, uh, 45 minutes. Um, if you would come back after 45 minutes to the atrium where Michelle Stewart's going to talk for a few minutes to frame the discussions for the workshops we're going to have in the afternoon. So thanks again for being so attentive and for coming back.